Blessed morning. Yeah, I would like to thank God um, for giving me the privilege to share His Word. I just came back from India and uh, I thank God for keeping me safe from the virus. And I also like to take this opportunity to thank Elder Peter because he's my hot backup. So if I'm tested positive this morning, <laughs> he'll be here. <laughs> so yeah. Um, before I start, I would like to read you an article uh, a brother sent me a few months ago. Um, yes, a brothel actually sued church, a local church over lightning strike. So a brothel um, began construction on an expansion of their building to increase their ever-growing business. In response, a local church started a campaign to block the business from expanding with morning, afternoon and evening prayer sessions at their church. Constructions progressed right up until the week before the grand opening when lightning struck the brothel and it burned to the ground. After the lightning strike, the church folks were rather smart in their outlook, bragging about the power of prayer. But the owner of the brothel sued the church, the preacher and the entire congregation on the ground that the church was ultimately responsible for the dismiss of her new building and her business either through direct or indirect divine action or means. In its reply to the court, the church strongly denied any and all responsibilities or any connection to the building's dismiss. The judge read through the plaintiff's complaint and the defendant's reply, and at the opening of the hearing commented, I don't know how I'm going to decide this case because it appears from the paperwork that we now have a brothel owner who staunchly believes in the power of prayer and an entire church congregation that believes otherwise. Interesting article, right? I was just wondering when I, wrote, when I read this that if, if, if it was Harold, would any of us be in, the, be in the prayer meeting in the first place, right? And what would we do? if we were in the situation of this church being sued. You know, will we play the harp and sling the stone? And what does it even mean, right? So, I'm sure most of you will know that from the sermon title that we will spend our time today learning from David. The King of Israel, the man that is after our God's own heart. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, the tribes of Israel came to David with this message. The Lord said to you, You shall be shepherd of my people Israel. You shall be prince over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came and anointed David king over Israel. The shepherd boy has become the shepherd king. It is easy to mark the path from shepherd boy to giant slayer, to anointed king, without taking into consideration the complexity, the hardship, the change that David had to endure and to go through. David was anointed king for the third time. Here, he was anointed king of Israel when he was around 37 years of age. Just seven and a half years earlier, he was anointed king of Judah when he was 30 years old. But today, today we'll go further back 15 to 20 years, when he was just 10 to 15 years. He was chosen by God and anointed to be future king of Israel. We will go back to the days when David was still a shepherd boy. The Lord rejected Saul and promised to raise another king, a man after God's own heart, a man who is better than Saul. God sent Samuel to Jesse, for God had promised himself a king among Jesse's son. When they came, Samuel looked at Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Wow, that was quick judgment. Samuel was evaluating Eliab based on just his appearance, his physical gifts. Eliab was tall, strong, and good-looking. Samuel might be thinking, God, good choice. One look and I know, this is the one. 
I know what you're thinking. Yes, I like him too. If we remember the last time a big, tall and handsome man appeared, Israel, uh, Israel chose him as king and that didn't really turn well, up well. It was a difficult concept. It is a difficult concept for Samuel as he was accustomed to a king whose only positive attribute was physical, was outwardly. Samuel made the same mistake the people made when they chose Saul. The Lord told Samuel, No, this is not the one. Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees, Men look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now, if the prophet Samuel could fall into this trap, how easy it is for us to fall into the same trap. We are prone of it, aren't we? We judge by outward appearance. We should not, but we do it so easily. Somebody stand, stands before me and we think we know. All we see is the outward package. We don't see the heart. We can be far too confident in our ability to judge other people's heart, but only the Lord can. Remember what the book of Jeremiah says about our hearts? Our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. No one can understand it, not even ourselves. If we can't even reliably know our own heart, how can we know the heart of others? Only God knows our hearts. He knows our heart better than we do. And we do not judge on outward appearance. But this is exactly the trap that Samuel slipped into. And if Samuel can slip into it, I suppose any one of us could. So instead, we need to seek God. We need to seek God's heart. We need to seek His wisdom. Most of us know how the story went. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. Samuel shook his head. No, the Lord has not chosen this. Are all your sons here? Jesse sent for his younger son who was keeping the sheep. He was ruddy, had beautiful eyes, and he was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Why did God choose David? Was it because he was a shepherd? No, there was a many shepherds. Was it because he was young? I'm sure that there are a lot of young folks around in Israel that time. Was it because he was good looking? Eliad was good looking. Was it because he was a son of Jesse? But God just rejected seven of his sons. What was it that made God say to Samuel, this is the one? It is because David was a man after God's own heart. Saul was still king and would continue ruling for many more years. But here the Lord commissioned Samuel to secretly anoint a young boy who was to be the future king of the nation. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. Does Jesse and the son know what is happening? Originally, oil was used exclusively for the priest and the tabernacle articles. It was used later to include kings. It was forbidden to be used on outsiders and common people. David was not a descendant of Aaron. He was not from the tribe of Levi. So David cannot be, appoint, be appointed, anointed as priest. David and his brothers knew what the anointing symbolizes. They did not proclaim it because it would be considered treason. Whether they knew it or not, 
that's beside the point. Most importantly, David was not just anointed with oil. He was anointed with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord is with him from that day forward. Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and the harmful spirit tormented him. Saul's servant advised to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the harp. Through the music, Saul may find comfort from the harmful spirit. And one of Saul's servants recommended David. This is David's resume. Son of Jesse, the Blephamite, an excellent music musician, a well-spoken person, good-looking, courageous, skillful in combat. Well, my Chinese is not very good, but some Chinese idiom came to my mind when I read this. Uh, meaning poetic, and a master in pen and word, sword, not word, sword. Where to find, right? And most importantly, the Lord is with him. But David was just a shepherd boy. How did Saul's men know about him? I guess many would have heard him in the field praising the Lord with his psalms, with the beautiful melodies that came out from his harp. Many would have shared the stories of his bravery when he saved his sheep, when he killed the lions and the bears. Even as a shepherd boy, David lived a life that brought glory to God. The advice was sound. Saul liked it, so he approves it. So David was recruited. He was called to the king's court to comfort the king. And Saul loved him greatly. Of course, Saul had no idea that he would be his successor. And whenever a harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the harp and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. Now, will you play the harp? David was just anointed king of Israel. Can you imagine David saying to the father and the brothers, look, I'm just anointed king. Treat me as one, right? Show me respect, serve me, all right? Go and tend the sheep. And who is this Saul, by the way? I'm not going to serve him or smooth his heart. I am going to replace him. But David did nothing of such. He continued his duties as a shepherd boy, obeyed his callings until the plan of God for him is fulfilled. We see in 1 Samuel, Samuel chapter 24 and 26 that David spared God, um, Saul's life twice, even when Saul was pursuing him and trying to kill him. Why? Why did he spare Saul's life? Was he afraid of Saul? No. For he explains that no one can put out his hand against the God's anointed and be guiltless. David was not afraid of Saul. David was obedient to God. Will you play the harp? Will you be obedient to God? Besides being obedient to God, I feel David was also doing it out of love. Saul was in pain, much pain. David must have, David must have played his best to soothe Saul's pain. It was mentioned that Saul, Saul loved him. He was not there just to fulfill his duty. David used his God-given gift to comfort Saul. Will you play the harp? Will you love your neighbor as yourself? Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle against Israel. Both sides drew in line of battle, the Philistines on a hill, and the Israelites on another, with a valley between them. Goliath, a giant nearly three meters, that's, that's higher than this ceiling, by the way, with impressive armor and weapons, stepped up from the Philistine line into the open. He mocked, 
he ridiculed the Israelites. He challenged the servants of Saul to pick his best men. Both of them will represent their people. They will fight till the death to determine the result of the battle. Goliath's battle experience, his size, gave him an advantage. But in his statement lies a hint why Goliath was so confident in this fight. Are you not servants of Saul? Prior to Saul being king, it was God who led Israel. It was God who led people into battle. It was God who brought victories. But when Samuel came and became king, the surrounding nations saw a human as the head and leader of Israel. Israel were no longer seen as servants of the God. Goliath saw this battle as a physical battle, man against man, or should I say, man against giant. Gripped by fear, Saul and his army were shaken and terrorized. No man, not even Saul, dared to step forth to engage Goliath in battle. But wasn't this the reason why Israel wanted a king? We want a king so that he can go out before us and fight our battles. That was what Israel said. Saul was head and shoulders taller than every man in Israel. That was why Israel chose him as king. For 40 days, morning and evening, Goliath came forward and took his stand without fail. Eighty times. Shouldn't King Saul step forward and say, well, that's enough. If nobody steps forward, I will go. No. Now he hangs his head in shame, just like the rest of his army. Jesse's three oldest son also followed Saul to battle, and Jesse was worried. He sends David to see if his brothers are well. So David arrived just as the army was moving into battle formation, shouting the war cry. David ran and greeted his brother when Goliath stepped out and gave his usual challenge. This has gone for 40 days, but this was the first time David heard this. He was like somebody coming late into a meeting, not knowing what happened, but trying to find out what is going on. So basically, David asked, Who is this guy, this uncircumcised Philistine? Who does he think he is, defying the armies of the living God? Is anyone going to do anything about this? What's going to be the reward? Why is nobody fighting him? By insulting the army of Israel, Goliath was insulting and defying God himself. This disturbed David deeply listening to such insults and curses against the living God. Why? Why is nobody doing anything about it? Eliab's brother, oh, which is David, but I try suppose to say Eliab's was David's eldest brother, overheard this and he's like, David, what are you doing here? Why are you asking all these questions? Can you just shut up and go back and tend your sheep? I'm just guessing what is going on through Eliab's mind when he said all this. You are my baby brother, David, and you're asking all these questions. I am the one that is representing the family. I am the one that is representing Israel in this battle. You are making me look bad. How often does someone ask a simple innocent question about us that reminds us of our failings and instead of answering it in an innocent as an innocent question we respond in anger because our pride is hurt i believe that's how eliab reacted and remember when samuel first saw eliab similar to saul 
Eliab was king material outwardly. But when the time comes, both stepped back in shame. The things David was saying were picked up and reported to Saul. Saul was ecstatic. Finally, somebody brave enough to step up. Bring him to me now, immediately. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Just to note here, as I covered earlier, David was around under 20 years of age and he's not even old enough to be enrolled in Saul's army. He was just a teenage boy. So imagine Saul's reaction when he sees David enter his tent. Are you joking with me? This is both humiliating and an embarrassment. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For you are but just a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. This reminds me of Joshua and Caleb. Hundreds of years ago, when God instructed Israel to enter the Promised Land, Joshua and Caleb assaulted Israel in the same fashion regarding the Anakim giants. David's faith, like that of Joshua and Caleb, was met with disbelief. But David was not discouraged. David looked after his father's flock and many times fought and killed lions and bears when they tried to take his sheep. David assured Saul that this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the army of the living God. David is not relying on his own strength or skills. He is relying and trusting God. Just as Lord has helped him ward off beasts and endangering his sheep, God will help him in his new responsibility as shepherd over Israel. Saul finally gave in and allowed David to fight Goliath. He clothed David with his armour, which I find it weird because obviously the armour won't fit. But maybe, just maybe, Saul would have thought, what if David won the battle? I might get some credit, you know, because he's wearing my armour. Anyway, David could hardly move with his armour. He has not tested or trained in it before. It was only burden to him in the battlefield. And you know what? Even with Saul's armour, I don't think that it will withstand or protect David against the sword and the javelin of Goliath. Anyway, David already had the spiritual armour of God. David approached Goliath with just his staff, five stones and a sling. He did not foolishly think that he would defeat Goliath by himself. David went in the name of God, the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom Goliath has defied. It was God who would defeat the enemy. David slinged the stone and he struck Goliath on his forehead and he fell. David prevailed over Goliath and killed him with a sling and a stone. David fought Goliath not for his own glory. He did it so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. When David heard Goliath's defiance against the Lord's army, it instantly ignited his righteous anger. David knew that such defiance cannot go unchallenged. Neither Saul, neither, neither Saul nor his army looked to God that day, the whole 40 days. Instead, they focused on Goliath's size and weapons. For all the armies of Israel, Goliath was more real than their God. For David, God was more real than Goliath. 
He knew God was mightier. David's faith in God gave him the confidence. Perhaps this is why David wrote, it, wrote in his Psalms, Even though I walked through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. The giant killer, a giant killer, has got to be a person of giant faith. So, will you sling the stone? Does it bug you when belief in God is ridiculed in the society? Does it anger you when God's name is used in vain? Does it bother you when the people of faith is belittled? Do you even care? It sure bothered David. It was David's consuming passion that God be honoured. Will you sling the stone? Will you love God, our Father, with all your heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength? Are you interested over the things of God? Will you hold one another accountable out of love for the gospel? Are you like David, who is willing out of love for one another and of God say, what is going on? Why isn't anybody dealing with this? And step forward and deal with the matter with God's leading. Or are you like Eliab, who says, why? Why are you asking all this? Are you trying to make me look like a fool? Let's not deal with the plank in my eyes. I can see well. I hope all of us are like David, willing to play the harp and sling the stone. I also hope while we convince ourselves that we are like David, that we search even deeper and ask ourselves this. I am willing, but can I play the harp? Can I sling the stone? Do I have the heart for God? What foundation is my faith built on? Do I have the gifts to play the harp and to sling the stone? David probably wrote these psalms when he was just a shepherd boy. When I look at your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moons, the stars which you have set in place, the heavens declares the glory of God, the sky above proclaims his handiwork, day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. David was all alone with his flock in the field. In the night, he looks up into the sky. He sees thousands of stars. He sees the Milky Way. He declares God is even bigger, even mightier, because God created it all. David is humbled because he recognized how small he is and how real God is. Who am I, Lord, that you know me? Who am I that you love me? That you anoint me as the future King of Israel? It is just him and the Lord out there. And David drew close to God and he spends time with him. By keeping the sheep, David knows how the sheep needs to be taken care of. He knows how much the sheep rely on the shepherd. And David realized that he was also a sheep and God is his good shepherd. And during this time, David probably learned and practiced playing the harp, wrote the Psalms and sang it with all his heart. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. David had a deep relationship with God during his early years keeping the sheep. Do you have a deep relationship with God? Is God the priority, the centerpiece of your life? 
Have you spent time with Him? I don't mean just coming to church or listening to sermons. Have you spent time in prayer? How often, how long do you talk to God? Have you spent time in God's Word? When was the last time you opened up your Bible? When was the last time you read and meditated on His Word? Have you spent time alone with God? Or are you too busy? Are the noise in your world so loud that it cancels out the gentle, loving whispers from our Lord? Have you spent time marvelling and declaring His greatness? Have you stopped, experienced the wonderful things that He had done around you and in your life? Have you sang in your heart, in awe, a thankful song to our Lord, our Father? Make God the priority and centerpiece of your heart and life. David did not spend all of his shepherding days walking the sheep, playing the harp, and singing songs to our Lord. David is always on the alert. He ensures the flock don't wander off. He keeps them safe from predators. He practices slinging the stones, spending many days, nights, weeks, months, years in perfecting the accuracy, in mastering the skill. But skills alone does not make him fearless. There were times when his life was in danger. There was time that he was terrified. Whenever he finds himself in such, such situations, he recalls the time that God blessed him, that God protected him. David grew in faith and trust in the Lord when he was out keeping the sheep. Unknowingly, his years of shepherding have served as training ground and God was preparing him for greater things. When Goliath ran towards him, David didn't drop down on his knees and prayed, Lord, now is the time. Strike him with a lightning from heaven. Open the ground. Swallow him in. Send the lions. Send the bears. Lord, kill him. No. David knew the battle belonged to the Lord. He knew the victory belongs to the Lord. But he also knew that God wanted him to be part of it. He ran to meet Goliath. David trusted in God so that his heart was calm. His hand was stable, was steady, and his aim was sure. When everyone else thought, how can I beat Goliath? He's so big. Goliath thought, Goliath, sorry, David thought, Goliath is so big. How can I miss him? Many Christians struggled at this point. They asked the question, is God supposed to do it? Or am I supposed to do it? Maybe I should trust in the Lord and see how things turn out. God desires to work through people. Do as the Lord leads you. And in doing so, trust Him and rely on Him. David was faithful with a few sheep and inherited the whole nation. We must be diligent and faithful in performing the tasks and work that we are put currently. Whatever we do, we do it as though we are doing it for God. Sometimes in life we say, well, can I skip over the lion? Can I just skip over the bear? And God, just send me straight to Goliath. But God says no. I will prepare you with smaller, significant challenges. And I want you to trust me in this. Otherwise, you will never overcome the giants. The shepherd boy has become the shepherd king. It is easy to forget that it took David around 25 years from his first to his third anointing. 
it is, it is easy to be excited about David as the giant slayer, as the king of Israel, but we must not forget where it all started. David had a strong foundation. David did not become suver of Saul and a giant killer overnight. David was faithful over little things, and more was given to him. The habits and foundations of David's youth never left him. He was diligent and wholehearted in performing what was entrusted to him. When he was afraid, he trusted in God. When he was discouraged, he turned to God. And when he was alone, he praised God because he knew that his Holy Spirit was with him. He was never alone. David was a lifelong seeker of the Lord that he loved. There's a lot to learn from David, but more importantly, even though David won a great victory, it was not greater than the victory that Jesus Christ won on our behalf. It was not an incident, accident that Jesus was known as the son of David. David's victory over Goliath is a picture in advance to the victory Jesus won for us on the cross. Both David and Jesus were sent to the battlefield by their father. Both David and Jesus went to the battlefield alone. Both David and Jesus were scorned and rejected by their own brethren. Just as unlikely as David's victory over Goliath, so was Jesus' victory over sin and death. Both David and Jesus fought the battle, knowing that victory was assured even before it started. And both David and Jesus brought glory to God's name. Ultimately, it's not about David. It is about David foreshadowing Jesus. It is about God's power, about his provision, about his promise. It is about his anointed one. It is about Jesus Christ. Remember this article? As I prepared for the sermon, this article kept on popping up in my mind. What would I do? What would David do? Then I realized something. It doesn't matter what I think I will do or what I should do. Because when it really happens, I doubt I will do what I think I will do now. My actions will be determined by my foundation in the Lord, not by what I simulate in my brain. David knew that he would become king, but he never thought what he would do when he became one. He lived his life as usual. He continued to be faithful over little things. He tended his ship, learned to sling, learned to play the harp. He constantly praised and rely on the Lord. With each lion he killed, with each sheep he saved from the mouth of the bear, his faith strengthened. And when situation arises, he responded according to God's will. He soothed Saul's spirit. He defeated Goliath. He raised and became king. It is pointless for us to work out in our mind on how we will react in hypothetical scenarios. We can never foresee what is coming. We just need to be faithful over little things, which prepares us for the bigger ones to come. And when time comes, can you and will you play the harp and sling the stone? Will you love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength? Will you love your neighbor as yourself? Let us pray. Lord, help us to be faithful over little things. Prepare us for the giants that we will not cave in in shame, but stand up for your name Help us to love you, Lord, and to love our neighbours. 
In our Lord Jesus Christ's most wonderful name, we pray. Amen.